<laughs> we'll come back to Army Hammer. Yeah. Because I see Jack Douglas is with us. Are you there, Jack? Can you hear us? So, so wait a minute. His father was the famous Mike Hammer. The detective. No, right. not the. Uh, yeah, I thought that too. <laughs> not the right detective. There. Yeah, I know. I, created by Mickey Spillane. <laughs> yeah, how about that? What a coincidence. How you doing, Jack? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good. <laughs> Man, we were so excited to talk to you a few weeks ago, and I know you were sick, but. Uh, yeah, I had my bone bladder out. What fun. Oh, oh, oh wow. How are you feeling? I wasn't really sick. I'm getting used to the new plumbing, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> good. Cool. Well, I've just been so excited to talk to you because, uh, you know, you were the last person to work with John Lennon. And then there's a million other credits, too. But we're we were big classic rock lovers on this show. So so many questions. I don't even know where to start, but I, I think I want to start by asking you about uh, John's motivation for making the, the final record, because I would read and I know Beatle fans just are dying to know this. Uh, that John was inspired by hearing McCartney on the radio a lot. Coming Up was out, and it was a big hit. And I guess John, I don't know, I heard that he liked it, and he was like, I, I got to get off my ass. Was that? Did that have anything to do with it? Did he ever speak of that? Well, we did. We, not that specifically, but we used to speak quite often about how he wanted to compete with Paul. Mm. Because, you know, Paul inspired John. If Paul did something that was really cool, John would be like, I have to beat that. <laughs> and so, they, you know, they kept upping the bar by doing that. And they did that their whole careers, apparently. So, yeah, he was attempting to up the bar. But um, but the funny thing was he was very insecure about whether he would be able to do it. And that's why the project was so secret for so many months that even the musicians uh, who I rehearsed with didn't know whose record they were making. Wow, you rehearsed all those songs with Earl Slick and Huma Kraken? Well, no, not with Earl. Earl I brought in because I wanted a wildcat. I wanted someone who didn't know the material <laughs> to just jam over it and to see what we got, you know? Oh, wow. I, I wanted it. But, I, yeah, uh, Tony Levin and, and, uh, and Andy Newmark and, and Huma Kraken, I, what I did was John gave me a tape of all the songs. And, well, the first, first he sent it to me from, from Bermuda. It was two cassettes. Huh. Wow. And they were, they were narrated by John. Most of them said, here's another piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> this, this one I want to give to Ringo. Uh, there were three songs, uh, like a, a couple of years ago. I, I gave. I asked Ringo. I said, did, "Did you ever hear the tape where he says he wants to give all these songs to you?" And he said, "No." So I made him a, a CD of it, and and I, I saw. Then I saw a, a Ringo about a week later, and he was. He said it made him cry to hear that, and I said, "Let's go in and do one of these tunes." And so uh, we went in and we did uh, "Grow Old" along with me with uh, with Paul on bass, and. And Ringo on drums and Joe Walsh, his brother-in-law, on guitar. Oh, wow, hmm. what and a great Paul song! Kind of cool. Yeah, so you, and that was that, that came out on Milk and Honey, which was the follow-up to, uh, to. Yeah, Double but Fantasy. it was only it's only a demo that it didn't come out on Milk and Honey because we never recorded it. Anything that came out on Milk and Honey was because I insisted that he do live vocals on everything we did. So everything from Milk and Honey was recorded during the the uh, double fantasy sessions everything um, and so, it, but what what you have on those on, on milk and honey are the live vocals which were were really good and when we jay messina and i sat down to do the stripped down version of uh, double fantasy we used the original uh, live vocals and uh, and the original rhythm tracks just the rhythm tracks without the sweetening huh. which is kind of cool. It was very good. We didn't double his voice, which he loved to do. Yeah. But going saying that it was secret, he, he he I went out to their beach house out in Long Island, and um, and Yoko gave me these uh, this envelope that said for Jack's ears only, <laughs> and then she said to me that John's going to be on the phone from Bermuda in a few minutes. And so he called me up and he said, I want you to listen to these cassettes. I'll call you tomorrow. You let me know if you think that there's anything on. Them. And the cassettes were really raw. It was just uh, 
him playing guitar or piano and then into a boom box and then him playing through the speakers of the boom box into another <laughs> boom box. Oh my God. So he could track or do little overdubs. Huh. And the drums were just like either a drum machine or uh, um, Fred Seaman banging on pots and pans, <laughs> who is his assistant down there. Anyway, there were all, I mean, there were 30 songs on two cassettes with a lot of dialogue. And so um, I listened to those, and the next day John called me at home, and he said, what do you think? And I said, I think you should just put these tapes out just the way they are because there's something about them that's just magical. <laughs> She's, he said, so you think that the material's good? I said, I said, yeah, the material's <laughs> great. I love it. He said, good, that means we're going into the studio because there's no way I'm putting out those fucking tapes. <laughs> wow. Hey, Jack, and on so, those cassettes, was, was Free as a Bird on there or Real Love or Now and Then? Real, real Love and Now and Then, but not Free as a Bird. Free as a Bird came from another era. Okay. Uh, have and, you, now and Then, and, have you heard much about Now and Then and the fact that this might be the final Beatles song? Is that? Yeah, I think it's really cool. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, of, uh, of AI because, you know, what they put out was kind of, I thought, cheesy. But I think if Paul does it, um, I, I think it's legitimate. Yeah, it sounds like they all worked on the song. And I, there was something out today said well, everyone's on the song. Wow. George, I get so you, you, you you'll probably be, um, it, it'll probably not be George on it at all because you he, he can play on the on the demo. Yeah. But uh, and and John said, okay, if you don't like it, no problem. So it's that old. It goes back to Beatle days. Wow. Um, That's how old. Hey, Jack, on, on Double Fantasy, uh, there's this great version of I'm Losing You with Cheap Trick, who I assume that you brought in because you worked with I Cheap did. Trick. And I, that's to me, that's the coolest thing possibly from that whole album. And it's not on the album. Um, no. It's, it's on the box yeah. sets and stuff. But why, why didn't it get on the album? Well, um, okay, so I'll tell you that story. I thought that eventually in my, my single fantasy was that Cheap Trick would go on the road with John. I thought that would mm. be a great match. Yeah. And. And, um, and so I wanted to bring them in to do some work with him. And I thought these were the, that was a harder rocking song than I was doing with the, with the original rhythm section, uh, which were, you know, great New York session guys. Uh, so I called up George Martin, who was a good friend of mine. And George was down in uh, Montserrat with Cheap Trick. And I, and I said to George, uh, listen, you've got my guys, and I've got your guy. <laughs> <laughs> which he cracked up. About. I said, is there any chance I can borrow two of two of my guys to come up here and play with John? And he said, no, it'd be my pleasure to do that. Nice. And so, and so uh, Bunny and Rick came up, and they jammed for a while. John wasn't quite sure when I said cheap trick, he didn't know who it was. But when Rick walked into the control room, he went, oh, that that guy. <laughs> that, that guy. Yeah, he's very and, characteristic. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> Recognizable. And, and so uh, they jammed on the song with Tony Levin on bass. And that's where that's where it, got, it came from, you know, that whole feel now we listened back to it we mixed it and we sat there and um and john and yoko both said we love it because we did uh a moving on with uh with cheap trick as well for yoko so but but we had to unfortunately and i agreed that it didn't fit on the album it suddenly was a huge departure yeah, it was a big you know, sound. Yeah. <laughs> from this from this thing that we were setting up, which was an audio play, sort of. They called it a, uh, a mind play or something. I can't remember, but it was definitely a play of some kind. So it, it, had, to, it had to hold together. So I agreed that we should do it now. We, since we have the arrangement, 
we should do it with the with the uh, house band that we put to, that I put together. And what I did was I played the cheap trick version into their headphones, and they played along with it, played along with it, and played along with it. And I kept fading the cheap trick version out until it was totally out of their headphones. And then I hit the record button, and that's what we came up with. Wow. As close as I could get. Yeah. It's really good. Both of them are great. Um, how different you you were engineering on Imagine uh, with John in, yeah. in 1970. How different was it making an album with John in 1980 uh, as opposed to 1970? In 1970, you've got George Harrison, Klaus Vormann, Alan White, uh, Jim Keltner, and then in 1980, you've got a completely different band. But how? I mean, that was right after the Beatles versus 10 years later. Was it yeah. a lot different? Uh it was very different because you had Phil Spector involved, and and um, you know John lost his patience with Phil very often. I learned a lot from working with John uh, during that period, and and some of the stuff that we did later. And of course, I did a ton of Yoko albums that John and I did together with Yoko. Um, but what I learned is that John has very, very has a short fuse and very little patience. <laughs> and, you ha and you have to work fast and you have to anticipate everything that he is going to want or want to do, you know, is when you're doing a session with him, whether it's doing the vocals, whether it's doing the guitar overdub, you have to stay ahead of him the whole way, which he really liked about me because he knew I got it. And, uh, and so we... So in making Double Fantasy, we had a really good time making that record. We had a lot of fun, and and there was always good vibes uh, in the room, and um, there was a lot of laughs, and uh, uh, you know, and he he was the John that you imagine, you know, with the sharp wit, telling j stories and telling jokes and and taking the piss out of everybody, <laughs> and uh, that very. Like the John during Imagine, who was really on edge most of the time and was losing his patience, with Phil, who was basically fucked up most of the time. <laughs> yeah, it seemed that way. That record, though, uh, Imagine, doesn't sound like, you know, when I think of Phil Spector, the wall of sound and all this, you know, extraneous uh, atmospheric kind of stuff, and that record really doesn't sound like a Phil Spector <laughs> wall of sound record. For a very good reason. <laughs> and that was uh, that Phil was so blasted on alcohol and pills <laughs> that he made very, very little contribution to it. Okay. And, and Roy Sakala, who was a genius and who was my mentor, and, and, uh, and John did most of the work, and that's why it sounds uh, great. Very different. Um, now, now when we did, when we did uh, Happy Christmas... That was Phil in an environment that he understood very well. It was very big. We had kids singing. We had, you know, the six acoustic guitars around one microphone, all that stuff. And uh, and that sounds like a Phil record. Huh. And so, and, and that was all right. I worked on that as an engineer. That was all right. That was okay. Phil seemed to be, he just was so comfortable. He was uncomfortable with the uh, other stuff during Imagine. Yeah. But he was... Well, during that, there was only one song, so you know what? We didn't have to deal with him for the, any length of time. <laughs> the concert, for, the concert for Bangladesh sounds. Uh, I mean, that is. There's so many musicians on that. It's like the the house band is so big. Was that Phil? Because I know you worked on that too. Yeah. Uh, no, that Phil had nothing to do with that. Oh, really? Okay. No, it's a, uh, it's a big band, a big sound. Yeah, yeah, it was huge. The original. Uh, original i mean that was george producing it okay the when they finished doing the mix for uh, the album they kind of thought that's all we need and when we do the film we'll just play those mixes but it's not that easy you have to lock the film and you have to remix hmm. and so i got the assignment to do that uh and we had and we apparently was very close to the, the due date for that. And so we worked three days straight, honestly. Just uh, George was very cool. Um, he, you know, we had a good we had a good outline for what it was supposed to sound like because we had the original 
the, the mixes that were done for the record. So it wasn't that difficult. It was just a matter of getting it close to that and watching the film at the same time and locking it. Um, so um, well, we worked like three days, almost three days straight. And, and about every four hours, Patty would bring us tea and scones, and it was kind of nice. <laughs> then every six or eight hours, uh, George would go meditate for an hour. <laughs> of course. I would try that for a while. <laughs> Ended up just go finding some cocaine. <laughs> that's how I met. That's how I meditated during that period. <laughs> I'm surprised you're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, well, we got through it, and uh, and it was just really cool working with him. He was very, you know, he was like so relaxed, and he's just really cool and. Um, it didn't feel like the amount of pressure there really was on us. There was to be done. Yeah, all those guys had uh, tremendous pressure after the Beatles. Before the show, we were listening to some of the uh, some of your Aerosmith work, which uh, Jack has been labeled the sixth member of Aerosmith, I think by Aerosmith. <laughs> and yeah. we, we were listening to the intros to uh, Sweet Emotion and Seasons of Wither, which are two of my favorites. And those are, you know, long intros are out now. It's almost like there's no yeah. such thing. But yeah, those yeah, are guitar song. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, there's, it's a different it's a different day. I mean, listening to that, that stuff now is the equivalent to when I was a kid listening to Glenn Miller. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, I, yeah. and Glenn Miller must have sounded good because I love those intros. The Seasons of Wither intro is really long, but it's just it builds that song so beautifully. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't mean for me. I enjoy listening to that stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking about kids today. Okay. Yeah. That make big listening audience they are not interested in that let's get to the beat and you know and sing about you know uh, uh, sex right as fast as we can and broken relationships <laughs> right sure but, i mean let's get to it you know they don't want that and, and um but i still i i enjoy listening to those songs and i particularly like listening to um rocks which is so raw and nasty it's just yeah right. i like it I love Rocks. Uh, Sick as a Dog was one of my favorite Aerosmith songs. Uh, but Rocks doesn't seem to get as much attention as uh, no, Get Your Wings toys. or Toys. Toys has got Walk This Way and Sweet Emotion on it. And, you know, there you go. Did, Rocks have, did Rocks have a single, a, a single that did anything? Oh, Last Child did pretty good. Oh, and so did Back, Back in the Saddle has been used countlessly in film. Yeah. And, and then... So, yeah. That probably, you know, it didn't sell. What we're we're getting close to twenty million records on Toys in the Attic. Wow! But but but, but Rocks is caught. I think it's it's finally across ten. Unbelievable! All I know makes for my my, my lifestyle is. <laughs> Amen. Well, I hope so because you did all the great Aerosmith records, and I I, I can't for the life of me figure out why did you stop working with Aerosmith it seemed like it was on such a roll I know things were crazy and you know there's a lot of craziness with the wives and, and the girlfriends yeah. but it seems I, to me I would not have removed that element of Aerosmith at that time well I, you know uh, to, we probably weren't good for each other but we did get back together I mean the funny thing is that right after well, see, the last Aerosmith I, album I did then was uh, the live album, uh, Bootleg, Live Bootleg, mm -hmm. which did very Then I stopped. And then shortly after that, there, uh, I did Joe's uh, Let the Music Do the Talking, which is like a, a really like a good Aerosmith album without, you know, Steven. Stephen's vocals. Right. It's an album. So the relationship just went on, and then we got back together again uh, for a little South of Sanity, another live album, and then Honking on Bobo, <laughs> and then this last album. Well, yeah, no, it's been a very productive uh, relationship. What are you doing now, Jack? Are you producing? Are you producing music now? Well, uh, I just I'm doing a lot of film scoring, which is where I started in the business. Um, well, I started as a musician on the road. Uh, well, I really started is writing uh, is writing 
campaign songs for Robert Kennedy when he was running for the Senate. <laughs> Whoa. The kid, uh, that's what I was doing. Then I was a musician. I was on the road with Chuck Berry as a bass player. I hmm. was on major labels. I was produced by the Isley Brothers. I mean, I had a long uh, musical career. But at the same time, I was composing for TV shows. And um, when I got a job as a janitor at Record Plant, that's how I got in the door there. Uh, I was um, I was writing the music for the original ABC after school specials. <laughs> so wow! In the daytime, I was cleaning the toilets. At night, I <laughs> you know all these. There's so many people who started as janitor at record studios. Didn't John Bon Jovi start as a janitor at a record studio? Yeah, hard to imagine. I, but I've yeah. heard that a million times, yeah. and I'm always like, "Does that really? Were they really the janitor? You were. You really were the janitor." Yeah, it was. So John would. We were doing an Aerosmith album there, uh, uh, "Rock and Hard Place." Hmm. We were doing it at the Air Power Station, and John would would be sweeping up outside, and we would invite him in, and he'd hang out in the control room with us. Oh wow! And, so John and I became very good friends uh, through that, and we've just known each other a long time. So, and the uh, Another really cool thing was when we were recording Toys in the Attic, we were in Studio A, and Bruce Springsteen was in Studio B, which is you share a lounge if you're in A and B. <laughs> he, was, he was doing Born to Run. Oh, cool. We were, we were both on Columbia Records, and what would happen is... Uh, he would do something, and he'd come into our control room. Hey, you guys want to hear something? We'd run in and listen to, you know, having you freeze out. We'd go, holy shit, that's really fucking great. <laughs> we'd have to run back and, like, you know, do something really special on Toys in the Attic. And then run in and grab Stevie and, and, and Bruce and invite them over to listen to what we were doing. And that went back and forth like that for six months. Wow. Hmm. No kidding. Those were which was really cool. So we were bouncing off each other. And the president of the label <clears throat> came down one day, and there we are. There's Bruce Springsteen in one, and uh, Aerosmith in the other. And he went in, and he listened to Bruce. Then he came in, and he, we were nearly finished at this time. Came in, he listened to Born to Run album. Came in, listened to Toys in the Attic. And I walked him out to the door. Bruce Lundvall was his name. And he turned to me and he said, it's going to be a very good year for Columbia Records. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Man. Well, uh, you know, Bruce sounds like he was such a meticulous guy at that time and was so unsatisfied. It's not like it took a long, long time to do a record. But I, I mean, I would have thought Aerosmith would have been a little faster than Bruce Springsteen. But Aerosmith wasn't easy either, were they? No, it was very, it was, very, it was painstaking. <laughs> there were a lot. We would go over things uh, a lot because we had something in mind. You know, to, uh, get your wings. That didn't take long. But this, this we, you know, we were we came in just with uh, the, the bare bones of songs, and then really worked them up in the studio. Although we had a long pre-production period, unlike rocks, rocks we recorded right in our re in the rehearsal space in outside of Boston because it sounded good in there. We just brought a truck in. Wow. Trudy, ask him about the sugar packets. <laughs> in Sweet Emotion, I um, I read. Even it's me. <laughs> what? <laughs> he just I made it up. Howard's thing. Yes, it's sugar packs. Yes. The, in the, okay, in Sweet Emotion. It is. See? Wow. I was right. Yeah. I can hear it. You know, I couldn't until he said it. And then there it was. Good, good Neumann with a lot of compression. And then you just get really close to the mic and yeah. shake it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a great and, sound. You know, we, I mean, we would, we would all pick different sugar packs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can't the imagine. Uh, they had big, big. I can't. The song without it, I can't imagine. I mean, that yeah. sound is so iconic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Jeff, so what else are you doing? I, I have. Uh, I'm doing filming. I just did. I did that a thing recently with Marty Scorsese and Ron Howard. Um. Uh, which is Personality Crisis One Night Only, the David Johansson documentary. It's now on Showtime. Um, I just did uh, a film called, uh, scored a film called uh, Trust and Love. Uh, that come, That's going to the on the festival circuit. And I finished the Carol Dota story recently. Wow. 
Uh, do you, yeah. w would you like to produce an album again, per se, or are you too busy with the other stuff you're doing? Well, I produced that Detroit Youth Choir album. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, thank yeah, thank so you. I'm but um, I prefer, like, on my, I have a label now, uh, Confidential Records, New York City, and we released the Detroit Youth Choir on that, but we also, I signed Robin Taylor Zander, Robin Taylor's, uh, Robin Zander's son, and that album is out now. It's called The Distance. I'd appreciate it if you checked it out. Absolutely. I hear it's great. Yeah, it's great. It really is great. Yeah. And uh, that is, he produced that himself. Oh. So, or, you know, to sign things where I don't have to go in and produce it. Uh, so I can I can just run this label um, and and do the film scoring and some some. But whatever else. When when you have people on your label, do you hear them and go, oh, boy, I wish I'd produced that. Oh, I wish it had a little more. I wish the drums were louder. Or do you go through that? No, because I end up mixing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Robin's album I mixed with uh -huh. Jay Messina. Yeah, we mixed it. So, uh, And I knew then while I was mixing it that I wanted to sign him. So it's, uh, and you know, we, we, it's a small label. Um, but... Uh, we're probably we're probably done for this year as far as signing artists, and then next year we'll look at uh, more artists. Are you trying to sign rock artists? Because I, I just want rock and roll to continue, and people keep saying rock is dead, and and I hear some signs that things are not dead at all. Uh, or are you trying to sign anybody whose music has potential for commercial success? Uh, I mean, am I signing pop and rock and rap? No, not no. yet. Uh, I have a, a girl named Kelly, uh, Ellie Lowe. She's out of Atlanta. She's a bit poppy, but more on the bluesy poppy side. Hmm. Uh, I'll go into, I'll, she's great, and I'll go into the studio with her shortly. And I've placed one of her songs in a film. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I, I'm only going for what I really like. And so, it, you know, it's probably not going to be uh, any rap. I would I would be interested in, in some Latin on the Latin scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, going so, going okay. back outside of uh, outside of records that, that you produce, which is many, many, many. Um, are there albums that you have f favorite albums production wise where you go, oh, my God, that's one of the best Bruce albums ever in, in the rock genre that we would know that you think I are think, just fabulously I produced? Yeah, I mean, Pink Floyd records. I have, you know, I have. I, I'm a vinyl nut, and I have a, a really nice system. And man, when I put on Dark Side, Wish You Were Here, those those records just kill me. Uh, also, uh, Harry Nielsen records. I love them. I know John uh, loved Harry. John and Paul both. All Simon records, and of course, everything that's Beatles. And, Amen. And yeah, I'm, I'm really old school. What do I, what, I listen to classical music. That's my biggest influence. Mm. Uh, that's what I brought to Aerosmith was a lot of uh, Rachmaninoff and and uh, uh, Stravinsky. And actually, uh, I did a band called Clutch. Mm -hmm. And you know who they are? I produced the Elephant Riders album, and I just I brought them into a room and I played them uh, Stravinsky and I said uh, this is where we should be and one of the songs is the Rite of Spring on that album and with uh, with Aerosmith there's a ton of Prokofiev uh, and the chord changes I never you know I didn't tell him here's what we're, we're, too, we're stealing from Prokofiev <laughs> but you know when I would suggest a chord change they go oh that's kind of cool it's like well, it's just a, a lift from, you know, somebody who did it a hundred years ago. But, but, uh, <laughs> but it, that kind of stuff works. Yeah. Oh, it but works so well. It works so well for the Beatles. I and mean, when they started getting strings and orchestras and yeah, it just adds you know, a different it's, element. It's not, it's with the Beatles, it's not, if you were to analyze their chord structure is so off the wall. I mean, it started around, uh, well, even earlier than Rubber Soul, but it particularly in, at Rubber Soul. And then on, I mean, I, you know, I played in bands and I just, 
the musicians weren't playing the, the, the same kind of chordal uh, progressions here in America that they were they were doing some great stuff. I mean, really, it's subtle. Yeah. And it's so good. And it makes for like a great song. They just knew it. it you know, it's amazing this day. No, I'm still listening to it. I can't wait for a new Beatles song. It's like, what could be better than one more Beatles song? <laughs> I hope Paul puts out another yeah. record. I just can't get enough. It just never goes away. It's like a pleasure center in my brain. And, and Jack, for you to be a part of it is just so cool and so incredible. And I hope we don't bore you with all these questions. But it was fantastic having you. And I so appreciate you giving us some time after being in the hospital and all that. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. You know. I look like I was. It looks like I lost a knife fight, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you look pretty good, Jack. I'm, I'm on the mend. I was there actually in the office yesterday, and I was dealing with my real estate people today, and I'm, you know, and uh, there's my dog. How I am? Hey. Uh -huh. <laughs> it looks okay over there. Uh, yeah. Again, Jack. So, thanks. Thank you so much. I so appreciate the time. It's great to finally get to talk to you, and I hope we do it again. You're very welcome. All right. You have a great, great day and weekend. Bye. All right. Hi, Jack. Jack Douglas. All right. <laughs> wow.